uh, we are starting our program, the, the examination of fetal brain in 2D and 3D. So I have one disclosure to make. I'm still the consultant for G Healthcare as I was yesterday. And by my training, I'm a pediatric cardiologist, so the brain is a very new thing for me. So hopefully we will get through this together and uh, learn how to manipulate the brain volumes uh, in the first trimester, and I will demonstrate how useful it could be. So, but first let's um, go back to our traditional 2D imaging. So usually we can take the sweeps or the still images as we discussed yesterday in one plane and here you can see the axial sweep of the fetal head in about 13 weeks of pregnancy and uh, you can see that the multiple views can be obtained from that sweep and they contain a lot of information that we discussed. So also the similar we can do in the different uh, planes and if the baby is in a good position so you can achieve the perfect coronal uh, sweep. This is um, what this clip demonstrates and we can retrieve uh, the images that demonstrate the facial structures and that at the middle of the head, so the uh, ptolemy and the third ventricle. So, but uh, the problem is that the 2D image that you can see only one plane in the still image or in the clip in a time. And this is why the uh, 3D could be very useful. And to demonstrate the utility of the 3D, and not just in, for the first trimester, but for the second trimester, and in particular for the brain, I would like to show you this image that you can look at that and see that this is extremely inappropriate, right? So, um, and this is the reason why we need 3D. Because, you know, in 2D images, sometimes things can look really abnormal and really concerning and really, um, you know, provocative. But indeed, if you turn the 90 degrees, the picture gets much better, more appropriate, and pretty much explains the first image that you saw. So this is why I think that the 3D is extremely valuable in your everyday practice. And as you can see that it's very um, often used for the assessment of the brain. For example, this is the assessment of the posterior fossa. So without the very um, accurate mid-sagittal plane, you probably won't be able to make the differential diagnosis of the anomalies of the posterior fossa, such as a dandy worker variant, dandy worker malformation in the black spot. Cyst. So that, that definitely has a very uh, significant diagnostic value. Thank you so much, Leslie, for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here this morning and talk to you about this topic, which is very near and dear to my heart. I have no relevant disclosures. We're just going to kind of cover the basics today. If you have not used ORADS before, um, Welcome. I'm glad that you're interested in hearing about this. We're going to start talk most of the time about ultrasound, uh, give you a little bit about the basics, the, the assessment categories. We're going to go over the lexicon and governing concepts. There was already an update, if you were not aware. It, with the lexicon first came out in 2018. Uh, November, the risk stratification system uh, was out in early January of 2020, and we've already had an update. As often happens with new systems, we realized there were some issues that needed to be addressed. And then I'm going to conclude just with a little bit of ORADS MRI because that is the other arm to this system. So background, why do we need this system? Why do we need ORADS? Well, it turns out that most lesions that end up coming out of a woman turn out to be physiologic or benign. They didn't need surgery. And the morbidity from that needless surgery is not small, right? About 15% of women end up with some sort of complications when these could have just been left alone. Now on the other flip side of this is women who have ovarian cancer, if that initial surgery can be performed by a gynecologic oncologist, they will have a better outcome long-term survival. So we want to get them in the right hands as soon as possible. You put that together with the fact that we love our terms complex and heterogeneous, right? Everything that just isn't simple becomes complex or heterogeneous. And that can be used to describe these three different lesions 
that have very different outcomes. Some are going to go away, some you know, possibly don't need to come out, and others are very malignant. So we can and we should do better, and we can do that with ORADS. Just like all the RADS systems, the intent is to standardize the terminology so we're all speaking the same language. We're going to give a risk of malignancy, which is going to be helpful to both the patients and the providers, and then give some management guidelines for them. There's two arms to the system. Ultrasound is considered first-line imaging, and then MRI is going to be reserved for problem-solving. And again, we're going to talk most of the time here about ORADS ultrasound. So the basis. We did an extensive literature search. Most of the descriptors are from the IOTA group. IOTA stands for the International Ovarian Tumor Analysis Group. And then we also searched the literature for a lot of the accepted lexicon terms for our classic benign lesions. We looked at outcomes data. When they took these things out, and again, from the IOTA one through three trials, they had over 5,900 cases. And then we matched kind of our terms that we had decided on with that data to come up with a table like this. And this showed us all the lesions we were looking at, different size categories, how many fulfilled that criterion, and then what percent turned out to be malignant. And malignant, when we say that, that encompasses both these low malignant potential borderline lesions as well as the frankly invasive lesions. So just so you know, when we say the percent of you know malignancy is something, it also includes these borderlines. But you can see it's falling into these categories here that really serves as the basis for our risk assessment categories. So those are all evidence-based. We do provide management recommendations. That was just expert opinion. There aren't a lot of, there's not a lot of evidence behind the management. So just keep in mind that just came out of kind of expert opinion from the consensus panel. The first lecture is going to be on ultrasound evaluation of vascular uh, emergencies. And I have one disclosure, namely I am an educational consultant for Philips Healthcare. And my objectives for this presentation are to, first of all, describe the role of ultrasound in the evaluation of aortic rupture and endoleaks following endovascular and abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. Then we're going to talk about the ultrasound appearance of aortic and arterial dissections. And at the end, we're going to talk about uh, a few uh, less common uh, vascular emergencies, namely pseudoaneurysms, arteriovenous fistulas, complications you might encounter following vascular interventions, and then lastly, portal venous gas. So starting off with abdominal aortic aneurysms, it's an estimated that up to 7% of adults in the United States over the age of 60 actually have a AAA, and this amounts to something just under about 3 million people. Risk factors are as follows. Uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms are six times more common in men than in women. They're much more common in older patients. If you have a first degree relative with an abdominal aortic aneurysm, you are at risk. Smoking increases your risk of everything. And if a patient has an underlying connective tissue disease, hypertension, elevated cholesterol, atherosclerosis, or has had trauma or infection, they have an increased risk of abdominal aortic uh, aneurysm. And most of these, as I'm sure you know, are asymptomatic. If a patient presents with rupture, they will present acutely and catastrophically with back pain and hypotension, and they may or may not have a pulsatile abdominal mass. And the mortality rate is greater than uh, 60%. And the general consensus is that if one clinically suspects that somebody has ruptured a AAA, that you probably shouldn't waste time getting an ultrasound, and the patient should go directly to the operating room or the angio suite possibly stopping by the CT scan for about five minutes to get a CT scan. Uh, ultrasound in the acute situation is really of limited use. When a patient bleeds into their belly, the hemoperitoneum causes peritoneal uh, irritation, which results in ileus, and then guarding if you push uh, on the anterior abdominal wall with your transducer. The end result is that due to the tensing of the abdominal musculature and the shadowing from bowel gas from the ileus is that you may not even see the aneurysm and you certainly have a low sensitivity for the detection of rupture. So basically what you are reduced to doing is looking for secondary signs of rupture, namely hemoperitoneum or perhaps retroperitoneal hemorrhage. 
But this is an example in which we uh, could actually make the diagnosis in a patient who presented with back pain and hypotension. And here you can see the abdominal aortic aneurysm. On top of it, you can see this heterogeneous crescent-shaped uh, clot. And then you can see some complex fluid in the region of the splenic hilum consistent with hemoperitoneum. But we don't see this uh, very often because, as I said, patients typically go directly to the operating room or to the angio suite.